So yeah, hey, uh, starting with the title right at the top, microservices, CI/CD pipelines with Azure DevOps and Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, this is what we'll be talking about uh, in the first half. Uh, so before that, let me just give a quick introduction about myself. My name is Abdul Karim. I am co-founder and principal SRE at Relambda. Uh, we provide DevOps and SRE services and consulting for our clients. Uh, I've been doing DevOps or SRE or sysadmin, whatever you call it, for more than a decade now. Uh, uh, I am a FOSS enthusiast, free and open source software. Uh, been a Linux user primarily uh, for major part of my, uh, you know, uh, career uh, as a student as well as, uh, you know, as a professional. So I guess more than more than 10, 15 years of, of uh, you know, FOSS exposure. Uh, I'm pretty active uh, in attending meetups and conferences. Uh, don't really talk much. Uh, but uh, you can find me at uh, you know uh, meetups in Pune or Bangalore uh, uh, or even these days online. Uh, and I'm an amateur gamer. Uh, I do play online games when I get time. These days it's hard to find time for that. But uh, yeah, I do that in my free time. Uh, these are my coordinates here. If you have any queries, uh, you know you can feel free to reach out to me or over email or LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, you know, choose your poison. Uh, so yeah, moving to the agenda uh, for today's talk, we'll be quickly covering monolith versus microservices. Uh, what exactly is a monolith and, and what is microservices? And maybe uh, talk about uh, my opinions uh, on, on, on this subject because uh, this is a very controversial topic. Uh, neither is better than the other, right? Both are equally bad, I would say. <laughs> uh, then we'll, we'll move to CI, CD, uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, just quickly try to understand what, what uh, these terms mean. Uh, uh, after that, we'll cover the tools that we we will be using for today's demo. Uh, primarily, the tools are Azure DevOps, Azure Kubernetes Service, and Azure Container Service. Uh, after that, we'll, we'll jump into a hands-on demo. And uh, uh, since this is a live demo, I hope the demo gods are with me. And uh, uh, I hope that we don't face any issues. Uh, 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 so yeah, let's let's hope for that. And and after that, we'll open the floor for Q and A. Okay. So monolith versus microservice. So uh, uh, typically, traditional computing has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, has evolved over the years. Uh, in the initial days, what used to happen was uh, uh, you you used to write code, uh, uh, copy that code onto a server, and just make it available for your users, right? So everything was bundled into one single, uh, you could say, Git repository. Uh, although it was not Git per se in the beginning. It could be very well, uh, you know, a, a zip file or a, a simple SCP of code onto the servers. Uh, and microservices is basically breaking down down that code uh, into individual components, right? So if you take an example, uh, if you are running a, a cab rental service like like Uber or Ola, uh, you can imagine there are multiple components uh, which are involved in building a service like this, right? There would be a booking API which is responsible to create a booking. There would be a pricing API which is responsible for uh, you know fetching the pricing based on time, location, uh, uh, you know demand, supply, etc. There would be a location API which would uh, keep a track of your drivers uh, and make sure that uh, whenever you open your app, you, you see the exact location of your driver, uh, or even when you are in a ride, right? It, it keeps a track of that. Uh, in a monolithic approach, what what would happen is you would have all of these functionalities in a single application. And uh, uh, if let's say you want to scale up the application, uh, you scale up in the chunk of, of this entire uh, big monolithic uh, you know, piece of code. Uh, whereas in microservices, you would have separate repositories uh, for these. And, and in, in most cases, you would also have separate databases for these individual services. So what uh, adv the advantage that you get there in a, in a sense is that you can scale these components individually. Uh, which means, let's say, if you if your company ha has run a promotion, uh, a campaign, and uh, uh, you are going to expect a lot of uh, you know visitors on your application, which might or might not turn into or or you know result into a booking, but it might put a lot of pressure on let's say the pricing API and and your location API, right? So if you want to individually scale the pricing API component, uh, uh, if you are in the monolithic side of things, you can just uh, you know simply scale. The pricing component, right? Uh, independent of, of other components which are uh, which are deployed. Uh, so scalability is one advantage in microservices. Uh, uh, other advantage would be, uh, I would say, uh, when when you go with a monolithic architecture, your repository grows 
over time right and uh, uh, if your repository is growing which means your team is also growing and ownership of code uh, you know git conflicts team conflicts they become an issue so it's slightly challenging with microservices every team um, has their own repo and they own it end to end uh, there are also some downsides to microservices uh, it adds a layer of complexity into the architecture the deployment becomes slightly more trickier uh, the deployment process becomes slightly more trickier right uh, whereas in case of monolith it's it's fairly simple right you have a single single artifact single binary which you just need to ship uh, and you can just uh, you know add on more servers and and deploying those binaries there uh, but in microservices uh, you 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 typically go with a cluster approach where you have a cluster of of uh, worker nodes and uh, uh, you apply some kind of bin packing to ensure that the required applications and and the number of instances of those applications are kind of distributed across this this cluster and every individual component should be uh, able to communicate with every other individual component so uh, there's a there's a there's an orchestrator layer which comes in between uh, 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 typically kubernetes or docker swarm or uh, azure kubernetes service as as we'll see in today's talk so uh, there's a there's a bit of added complexity in, in microservices so uh, again uh, if if we are to compare uh, purely on the basis of uh, you know which one is better it's hard to say but uh, in my experience what i've seen is companies or startups typically start with a with a monolith right a small code base and as and when uh, individual components require special attention you carve out microservices from your monolith so uh, that's the approach that i prefer uh but then again uh, uh happy to uh, you know have discussions or, or disagree on that some some startups have seen they go with microservices services from day zero uh and if you've been following the twitter trends lately there has been a very uh, popular article by amazon prime uh tech team where they kind of moved from microservices into a monolith the reverse journey and they've claimed that uh, by doing so they've, they've uh, you know uh uh they've achieved cost optimization up to 90% they've achieved performance optimization etc etc uh even dhh has kind of uh, written an opinionated piece about it dhh is the is a creator of ruby on rails uh, is the author of ruby on rails uh, which is a popular uh, web framework built on ruby so if you're interested maybe just read that blog uh, that that's cool uh so yeah i mean in summary uh with monolith you have simple deployment uh, difficult to scale individual components ownership is can be tricky and there's code inertia with time but with microservices uh, although you have complex deployment process but uh, individual components can be easily scaled and teams can kind of have clear boundaries and and clear ownership on the repositories uh, uh and it, it it enables you for faster iterations so uh, for example uh, there might be components in your code which might not change that often uh, and that layer could be your glue code layer for example authentication and authorization part right which uh, uh, does not really change often and every service is kind of dependent on it so you can carve that out host it separately scale up scale down based on requirement uh, without worrying about you know breaking things uh, uh, at least in that critical component and uh, you can you can basically deploy other stuff as and when you want so this is just an overview about monolith versus microservices coming to cicd uh, traditionally uh if if anybody here is uh, you know a 90s kid or or you know uh, born before 90s you would remember tools like filezilla uh, where uh, uh, you know development meant you wrote php code uh, and you ftp your code into servers directly there was no git there was no version control it was basically yolo mode of development uh, just uh, you know go full commando uh, and in case uh, let's say if you push uh, if there is some typo in the code or there is some error it directly you know reflects to your to your users and there's no remediation immediate uh, which is which is possible uh, but over the years things have evolved a lot uh, and this is how the ci cd kind of looks like today uh, uh, although this is not the complete picture it's just an overview again but uh, uh, there are a bunch of steps which have been introduced so uh, today what what would happen is as a developer you would want to push your code to a git server it could be github it could be bitbucket it could be azure repos anywhere any git repository and uh, uh, immediately after you push the code uh, there are a couple of pipelines that get triggered 
the most popular pipelines are build pipelines and deploy pipelines. But based on your, your organization requirements, you can have uh, you can do a lot, right? Uh, so essentially, it's just compute, uh, and and you can use that compute for anything. Uh, so uh, what would happen is you push your code, uh, a pipeline is triggered. You would want to run some unit tests. You want to run some integration tests on your code. Once that is successful, what you would do is you would build an image out of it, uh, which is an artifact. Uh, uh, think of an image as uh, something which is similar to a var file. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and you push it to a registry. Again, uh, a registry is nothing but an artifact tree for us in this case, right? Our code is compiled into an image and pushed to a container registry. And uh, uh, once that is successful, we can just call, uh, you know, make a call to our Kubernetes service and say, okay, fine, this new image is ready and just deploy it to my container so that uh, you know the users can use the new features. So uh, this is this is an overview of a modern uh, deployment process, right? With pipelines. Uh, the this diagram that you see here, this uh, in total would be your CI/CD, right? Often CI/CD is used as a single term, but uh, there is a there is a difference between CI and CD, right? Typically, organizations want to manage it separately. Uh, so, what exactly goes into CI? Uh, uh, in your in in the process, the there's build step, there is testing step, and there is release step. Release means pushing your your artifact, building your artifact, and pushing it to a artifactory, right? So these three steps are, are kind of uh, together known as CI, right? Continuous integration. And then you take that artifact and uh, make it available to your, uh, you know, dev environment. Or, uh, sorry, there's a typo here. I've written deploy, but this is dev environment, QA environment, and prod environment. So uh, why are these two separate? Uh, so uh, again, it's it's a very uh, long and subjective topic, but uh, uh, at a high level, there are two points that I would like to make here. First is uh, you would not want every git commit to result into a deployment because there could be issues uh, there could be failures uh, right so you would uh, definitely want a, a separation between uh, developers pushing code and code being deployed so that's a clear boundary there uh, second uh, i would say there is a there's a philosophy called build once and deploy everywhere uh, and what do i mean by that is uh, if i am a developer and if i push a code and uh, there is a image created out of that code uh, I should not have to build that image for every environment that I have, right? So uh, once my release process is complete, once my CI is complete, I have a, a, a Docker image. Uh, I should be able to take the same image and uh, uh, incrementally promote it through environments, right? So uh, yeah, I mean these are the two reasons why why uh, you know we kind of keep these two things separate. And uh, coming to the demo overview. Uh, uh, we will kind of try to cover the modern flow that we've discussed, uh, which is I push a code, it triggers some pipelines, it pushes, uh, you know, my Docker image to a registry, and it deploys the image to the Kubernetes service. And finally, the user is able to access the service via their browser or curl or, or any agent that they have, right? Uh, the box in green that we see here uh, is the only manual step in the process where uh, I would make a small change, I will push the change. And everything else should be kind of automated using uh, Azure DevOps pipelines. Okay. Uh, so yeah, before we actually jump into the demo, uh, let's quickly talk about these tools. So Azure, starting with Azure DevOps. So what is Azure DevOps? It's it's basically a, a collection of tools you can say which uh, 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 which allow you to kind of uh, you know build and maintain uh, the the DevOps or CI/CD pipelines for you. Uh, it includes services like repos, which is a Git Hub equivalent in Azure uh, universe. Uh, you you can push your code, you can pull your code, you can have pull requests and everything. Uh, then there is Azure DevOps pipelines. Uh, we'll kind of see a demo for that. So you can have build pipelines, you can have deploy pipelines, you can have uh, you know uh, security scanning and and and, and stuff like that. Uh, then there's Azure Container Registry. So if you are aware of uh, Docker Hub, uh, Azure Container Registry is kind of an alternate to that in Azure Universe. Uh, you are, our images will be stored in Azure Container Registry. And finally, Azure Kubernetes Service. So Kubernetes is a is a container orchestrator platform, as we briefly discussed. Uh, it is it is kind of comprised of mainly two different uh, uh, group of entities. The first group is typically referred as control plane and the second group is referred as data plane so control plane is basically the uh, 
components that are responsible for your orchestration and data plane is where your applications live. Uh, what uh, what the industry has realized over the past few years is that managing your own control plane uh, is a challenge uh, because it, it has a bunch of microservices. It is a distributed system in itself. It has HCD as a database. So backups of HCD, uh, restoring HCD, uh, you know, managing upgrades, uh, doing it all on your own, it is possible. You can have, you can just, uh, you know, create 10 different VMs and, and have three VMs for your master control plane and uh, seven for a data plane and, and very well manage it yourself. But it's kind of very challenging for, especially for small teams. So uh, cloud providers have come up with their own uh, managed offerings around Kubernetes. So Azure calls it Azure Kubernetes service and uh, uh, at a high level, it kind of owns the control plane for you, so you don't have to worry about the uptime and reliability and availability of your control plane. Uh, all you need to worry about is your applications. All right. So let's quickly move into the demo. Uh, OK, so uh, if you see here, I've already provisioned a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this kind of takes some time, so I thought I'll, I'll prepare uh, this beforehand. Uh, it takes, I would say, around five to ten minutes to provision a new cluster. So I have a cluster called CICD demo. Uh, uh, it's version 1.25.6. I have already attached a node pool as well. Uh, and there are some basic configurations which we'll not dig into uh, no, right now. Uh, and apart from that, I've also created a container registry beforehand. So uh, the name of our registry is RLCACD demo. We'll be using this information when we set up our, our pipelines using Azure DevOps. So uh, uh, we'll kind of revisit this again. And uh, finally, let's let's look at Azure DevOps. So in Azure DevOps, if you see here, I've created a project. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, before we actually go into the code, uh, as I was talking about, right? So Azure DevOps has repos, which is which is kind of the GitHub equivalent here. Uh, it has pipelines, it has test plans. We won't be talking about test plans today, and it has artifacts, right? So let's let's quickly look at the code structure that we have uh, in this sample repo. I'll be sharing the the repo URL in the slides, so um, you can you can kind of walk through after this talk if you are interested. So here, what we have is. Uh, uh, at the root, we have two directories. First is the app directory where our application code lies, right? This is a, a sample bootstrap uh, .NET application uh, provisioned using .NET new web app. I'm using framework version 7.0, uh, and it's kind of a hello world application for this demo. Uh, the only addition that I've done here is a Docker file. So Docker file is required because Kubernetes uh, does work on. Uh, it's a container orchestration platform, so we need to provide some kind of container to it. And uh, Docker is the most popular, uh, you know, container uh, containerization tool you can say. Uh, so we are using Docker here. Uh, so uh, if you just see, I'm I'm using a base SDK seven image. I'm starting from a base image. Uh, I copy the code inside the container uh, in the in the image. Sorry. Uh, we run .NET restore, which will basically uh, kind of gather and build the requirements and dependencies for the application. Although our app doesn't have much, uh, then we just do a, a .NET publish uh, so that we get a, a you know released version. And finally, we kind of uh, run the .NET app here in the final step, right? Uh, uh, I'll be I'll be building a Docker image out of this and and running it locally first, and then we'll move to cloud. So. Uh, all for that, and then there's a apart from app folder, we have a manifest directory. Uh, in the manifest directory, I've created two different resources. The first is a deployment resource. Uh, when I say resource, uh, it's a Kubernetes resource, or you can say a Kubernetes object, right? Uh, so these are the bare minimum requirements uh, if you want to deploy a web application and make it accessible to the outside world. Uh, so you need a deployment object. Although you could also go with pods or replica sets, but deployment is the most popular Kubernetes resource which is used, right? So uh, I create a deployment object. Uh, you can see that I'm using an image here, RLCICD demo. If you remember, this is the name of the registry that we have created, right? And this would be the name of the image. Uh, the container, the application will be running on port 80, so we expose port 80 here. And uh, uh, in the service object, we kind of expose again uh, we we define that uh, you know the container is, is listening on port 80 and the service should also listen on port 80 because that is a default uh, http port the keyword here is type load balancer uh, what this would do is it would create 
uh, an Azure load balancer for the service and expose whatever application is running inside this image via this load balancer. Okay, so that's about the code. Uh, do you have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand. I'm not able to see the participants list. I'm not sure. If... Okay, I guess the organizers can just keep a watch. If there's any questions, just feel free to stop me. Okay, am I still still audible? Oh, yes, you, you are. Awesome. There are no. Oh, OK, there, there is awesome. one question coming up uh, from Prasad like is manifest and artifacts are the same. Mm, no, not really. Artifact is is uh, artifact can be basically anything. A manifest can be an artifact. Uh, a Docker image can be an artifact. A zip file can be an artifact. So technically asking yes, uh, uh, our manifest can be artifacts and we will be rather using those manifests as artifacts uh, in our pipeline. So uh, I guess the demo will make it clear. OK, so this is this is my code here on my local, uh, the same structure that we saw there, right? Uh, before we actually go into the pipeline part, let's just build the image locally and uh, try to run it. So I do a Docker build. I tag it accordingly uh, based on uh, you know the container registry that I've created and the image name that I want it to be. And uh, to run this, I just run Docker run NP activity, right? So you can see here the application has started listening on port 80. So what we'll do is we'll just try to access localhost. So yeah, hello global Azure community. Uh, this is running from a local machine. Now our goal is to basically take this app and and ship it to our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, before we we do that, let's just see. QCTL get pods. I've already configured QCTL for my local machine, and if you see, uh, there are no pods running in my in my default namespace. Uh, and once we are done, we should see a pod running here for for our web app. Okay. So let's let's go to Azure DevOps, and if I go to pipelines, I see that there is no pipeline currently running here. We create a pipeline. So what we'll do is we'll break this into two parts. In the first part, uh, I'll create a build pipeline using the wizard, this UI that you see here, uh, which will essentially do nothing but create a YAML file and commit it to my repo. So there'll be a Azure DevOps pipeline.yaml in my repo. And once we have the build pipeline, we'll kind of uh, then manually try to add uh, the deploy pipeline by modifying the YAML, right? So let's start with the wizard. So I want to create a new pipeline. Where is your code? It supports all popular Git repositories, but our code is already in Azure repos. So we select Azure repos. Uh, it kind of detects my repository. So this is my repository, the repo name. And uh, I would want to build and push my image to Azure container registry. So let's select this option here. OK, let's select a subscription. It will just ask for my verification. OK. Cool, so authentication is done. Uh, I can see that I can. Uh, it is. It is already listing my container registry here. The image name, as we discussed, we kind of go with hello world, right? So, uh, just to give context, this is the registry name, and inside the registry, if I go to repositories, you see that there's a hello world, uh, you know, repository created here. This is present because I was already trying this out yesterday, and you can see there are a bunch of images already post. Uh, the latest one is 56. Uh, and we should see some new stuff here once our pipeline has, has executed. So let's go back to uh, Azure DevOps. Image name is hello world and Docker file. OK, so it's asking for the path to Docker file because you need a Docker file to build an image, right? So build out sources directory. This is a system variable which kind of uh, uh, is the root directory of my application. And inside the root, as we saw, 
we have an app folder and inside the app folder there's a docker file so this is the part um, i'll just say validate and configure Awesome. So uh, if you see here, it is creating Azure hyphen pipelines dot yammer. And uh, once we save this, it will commit this file into my repo. Uh, let's just go through this file. Uh, the first section here says trigger master, which means it will be watching master branch. Any push that happens into master will trigger this pipeline. Uh, regarding resources, uh, it needs self repo. The code which is uh, this repo is kind of self sustained. So it just needs, uh, you know, its own code. Uh, it has also declared a bunch of variables for me. Uh, the first one being Docker registry service connection. Uh, quickly, if we talk about service connections, uh, if you go to project settings in Azure DevOps, you can see service connection section here, and you see there are a bunch of service connections. Uh, why it is needed is because when you build the Docker image and you want to push the Docker image to ACR, uh, you need to basically authenticate with ACR, right? Uh, it's a private registry. So this connection kind of makes that access possible so that my pipelines should be able to push code to ACR successfully. Yeah, there's, there's one more connection here, which we'll see later, but uh, this is a Kubernetes service connection. Uh, again, if I want my pipeline to deploy something into my cluster, my pipeline should be able to authenticate with the cluster, right? It's not a publicly open cluster where anybody can do anything, right? It's a private cluster for my organization. So I need to set up that integration first. So these two these two service connections are kind of needed here. Uh, so this is the name. This uh, So the wizard has kind of done this for us, but if you don't want to use the wizard, you would, you would have to manually kind of uh, ensure that there's a service connection and, and you reference it properly. Uh, second variable here is image repository. Uh, we are calling our image hello world, which is fine. The third variable is the container registry URL. Uh, again, we've seen that it's called rlcicd demo dot azure cr dot io. Docker path we've discussed. Tag this is an important field here. Again, if you see, it is build dot build id, which is a system variable which will be made available to the pipeline during runtime. And we'll be using this tag to uh, tag our Docker images so that every new Build pipeline builds a new tag image for us, right? You don't want to use the same image again and again because let's say if you want to roll back from 56 to 55, uh, it becomes kind of convenient. Uh, there are different strategies people follow here. There's semantic versioning, there are branch based tagging, etc. etc. But for this demo, this is an opinionated version and a very simplified version of things. So uh, don't take my word for it, don't, don't take it to your boss. Uh, see what your organization needs, what you're following, and, and do the changes accordingly. Right. Agent name, uh, we will kind of get rid of this. We don't need it. Instead of that, what we need is pool. Uh, we'll also quickly talk, talk about pool first. Uh, the pool that I'm going to use here is pool 001. Uh, again, if I go to settings and if I go to agent pools, I see there's a pool 001. Uh, uh, why I had to do this is because the hosted agents were not kind of working, so I had to deploy Azure DevOps agent, a VSTS agent, onto a Linux VM and register that VM, uh, you know, as an agent here. So if I if I click on this pool 001 and if I look at agents, I can see there is one agent which is online, right? So this is running on a separate Ubuntu VM, uh, and all our code will be kind of CI/CD code will be executed from this VM. Right, so pool 001 is the pool that we uh, are targeting. Uh, coming to stages, so if you have used any kind of CI or CD tool in the past, be it Jenkins, be it GitHub Actions or Circle CI, uh, you'll see a similar structure there, right? Uh, so in, in Azure DevOps, you start with stages. You can have multiple stages, right? Right now, we just have one stage called build. Uh, so uh, there are stages inside, inside stages, there are jobs. And inside jobs, there are tasks, right? So that's how the hierarchy looks like. So uh, you can have multiple stages. Each stage can have multiple jobs, and each job can have multiple tasks. So uh, our, our job here has just one task, 
but you can also just go ahead and add another task. So if I say task bash, right? Uh, the wizard kind of makes it simple for you, but you can type the YAML all yourself. I'll just say hello world from Azure DevOps pipeline. Okay, and I say add. So it kind of prefills things for me, right? Uh, the indentation. Cool. So once I run this, uh, two things will happen. The Docker image will be built and pushed, and I'll I should be able to see a new image in my container registry, and I'll also see this message being printed by the pipeline. So fingers crossed. Let's save and run. So uh, since it's going to make a commit, I say save and run. Cool. So uh, as you can see, if I if I go to pipelines, okay, it's failed. Okay. Got it. So what it says is <clears throat> no hosted parallelism has been purchased. So like I said, the hosted stuff has been, uh, I'm not sure it has changed. So uh, we'll have to make a quick change here. I'll just go to my pipelines. Read the pipeline and uh, if you see here, it is it is using a hosted pool. But uh, we have already defined a global variable where we say that use use my own agent, right? And not the uh, Microsoft hosted agent. So I just remove that. See. OK. OK, so the build job has started. It will check out the code. Now it's trying to build the Docker image. OK, building has started. Uh, so, so, sorry, there is a question in the chat like the generated oh. YAML file. Will, mm -hmm. will that be also in uh, available into the re repository? Yes, yes. Yes. So if you create a YAML file with the same name as your pipeline.yaml uh, and push it from your local machine, it's equivalent to whatever we have done here. We just use the wizard because uh, uh, to make it easier for first time users to kind of you know get started with Azure and uh, it's pretty smooth. It just works most of the times, right? But we'll see, we'll also make the changes manually and commit it from our local. So, yeah, cool. So it says it is successful. Uh, if I go to my registry and if I refresh, Awesome. So I see a new tag which is pushed here, 58, which is 12:21 p.m. today. So uh, our code is working. Now the next job will be to add a new uh, uh, stage to this, which will be the deploy stage. So for that, what I'll do is, so since uh, there have been commits from the UI done, so I'll just pull the new code. And uh, if you see, there's a Azure Pipelines .yaml file which is kind of created. So I guess that answers the, the previous question, right? So let's just quickly go to I just open VS Code. <clears throat> awesome. So this is the same YAML that we saw uh, in the web UI. So what we'll do is we'll, uh, in the stages section, uh, we'll add a new new stage called uh, deploy. I've already kind of created a backup file uh, just to save time. So if you see, there are two stages here. We'll we'll copy this. Stage deploy. So let's go through the stage deploy. Uh, okay, display name is self-explanatory. Depends on. Okay, this is an important field. What what we mean by depends on is this page 
will be executed only if uh, the build stage is successful, right? And uh, uh, it will be executed after the build stage and only if it is successful. Uh, so you can add this kind of dependencies between your your stages uh, to ensure that uh, you know there are no false deployments which which kind of go through. Uh, and after that, you see there is a job section here uh, where we have a deployed job. Again, display name self-explanatory environment dev. Uh, for for deployment jobs, uh, environments is a is a compulsory field here. Uh, and if you don't really have this environment created in in Azure DevOps, so uh, I can show you in Azure DevOps. If you see in pipelines, there is an environments view here. I already have an environment called Dev, but uh, even if you don't have an environment, whatever name you you mention here, uh, that environment will be kind of uh, auto created for you. And all the deployments for for that particular environment will be tagged or tracked in that environment. So it's kind of uh, a good thing to have. Next is strategy. So strategy run once deploy. If you see that uh, in the previous job, we don't really have a strategy run once deploy kind of structure here. Uh, but again, this this run once is is the default strategy. But you can also have advanced strategies like <clears throat> maybe rolling roll rollouts or or canaries. Uh, but uh, for for this demo, we'll just focus on run once. Uh, I'll be sharing the the link. Uh, I'll be sharing some resources in the, in the last slide. So if you want to know more or, or read more about this stuff, maybe you can you know refer to that. So uh, let's quickly look at the tasks which are there uh, in this in this job. So first task is download the artifact, right? So again, the first question that we had around manifests. So we will need these YAML files so that our pipeline can deploy the YAML. Uh, uh, and essentially, what it will do is behind the scenes, it will run kubectl apply. And to run kubectl apply, we need to give it some YAML, right? And those YAMLs, as we have discussed, we have stored it in in this manifest folder. So uh, the artifact manifest, and uh, we use a system variable again, which is nothing but the path of of this particular code repo for this build, right? Every build will will have a, a unique path on the system. So uh, it is like your repo path slash manifests. Cool. And the second job is uh, uh, basically to run deploy. On your cluster, uh, we spoke about the Kubernetes service connection uh, uh, in in Azure DevOps settings section. We saw that there was two service connections which are required. First was for Docker and uh, uh, sec Docker push, and second is for Kubernetes. So this is the same name uh, that that we see here. Namespace we would use default for now uh, because we want to deploy our application in default namespace. Uh, the path of manifests we we'll kind of use the artifact directory variable here. Uh, because that's where the artifacts uh, will be made available for me. Uh, so artifact directory slash manifest slash web app dot okay. And uh, the container section basically tells Kubernetes or, or other kubectl which image tag is to be used, right? Because if you see here, if I go to my web app dot yaml, I have already given an image tag here. But this is this is fine for first time deployment, but uh, uh, with every incremental deployment, I would want this tag to be updated, right? I would want 54, 55, 56, 58, right? So uh, you can kind of override this image tag in a way using this this container section here, and the format that you see is container registry slash image repository colon tag, right? Which is in line with the with the YAML uh, that we are using, right? So container registry is the first variable, second variable is the image registry and uh, colon tag. Right, so tag in our case is is the build number. Uh, in the variables, I guess. Oh, yeah, tag is just the build number or build ID. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, except that I just need to add one more task to my build job, uh, and I'll show you why. Because we are downloading an artifact, but we have not uploaded any artifact. Right, so we need to upload an artifact as well. So what I'll do is in the build job, I just Make sure that I upload the artifacts, right, and make it available at, at the manifest path so that I can uh, later on use it in the in the deploy job. So these are the changes that I've done here, and uh, let's just measure pipelines, get from it, and. Deploy stage and I do a git push. So before I do a git push, let me just open the Azure pipelines here. 
Okay. Uh, so if you see, uh, immediately the pipeline has been triggered uh, as soon as I push the code. So let's see what's happening inside the pipeline. Okay, it's doing something. And uh, now you see there are two stages. First is build and push, and second is deploy. Uh, let's monitor build and push. Okay, build stage is complete. Uh, if you see that this deploy stage is waiting, uh, and it says that the pipeline needs permission to access the resource because uh, since we created a new pipeline, the first time you you try to access an environment, it requires a manual intervention. So if I just say view, I just need to say permit. Uh, permit is done, so it should start in the deployment stage. Uh, okay, sorry. Meanwhile, there is a question. Uh, Prasad mm -hmm. need confirmation or clarification that .NET build and .NET publish has been done on Docker file, mm -hmm. and the deploy is on uh, YAML mm -hmm. uh, for, for the Docker images on Kubernetes. Is it is the understanding correct? I think really understand the question. Can you repeat yeah. that? Uh, yeah, or, or Prasad, please please feel free to come out of mute as well. So he, he just need confirmation that .NET build and .NET publish is done on Docker file, um, and deploy is on YAML for the mm -hmm. Docker image on Kubernetes. Okay, Prasad, would you like to add anything to the question? Fine, I'll I'll just try to answer that. Uh, so in the Docker image, what we are trying to do is we are trying to build the application. Right, so uh, now .NET is a new framework for me, so I'll just uh, maybe give an example for, uh, uh, let's say, a Ruby app, right, or a Python app, right? So in Py when you build something in Python, you have something called as requirements.txt, and I guess in .NET you have CS project. So in requirements.txt, I would kind of use some li libraries. So as uh, Nandudeep was talking about OpenAI, right? So there's an OpenAI NPM library that he's using. So those are the kind of dependencies that I need to make sure that uh, you know they are available for my application. So uh, uh, I do all that when I build the image, and uh, when I actually run the image, right, which is the entry point, the last line in the Docker file, that is the the .NET run command, right. So the the .NET run uh, in a way will be executed, uh, you know, when the container is is provisioned, uh, but the other commands before that they are part of the build build stage, right, and not the runtime. Uh, I hope that that answers your question, Prasad. Yeah, and in follow up, he has got another question like, uh, mm -hmm. where is .NET publish? It's inside the image. It's inside the Docker image. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, so our deploy stage is complete. Uh, if we see here, uh, you can see that uh, it first runs kubectl apply, right? And uh, uh, if you also follow up, it will first run kubectl apply. It will then check that the deployments are kind of up and running, and then uh, you know it it kind of does a kubectl get service for me as well because I need uh, you know the public IP, right? So it is giving me the public IP here. And uh, if I awesome, right? So this was the same uh, application that we kind of ran on our local host, and now we are running it in, in Azure Kubernetes service. And uh, uh, it was pretty seamless, and it's pretty awesome. Uh, uh, it's very interesting where you know to see things have become so smooth over the years. Uh, but to achieve something like this was was insanely difficult a few years ago. Uh, but yeah, thanks to the the tools and and stuff that you know, it's, it's it's made it a breeze. So uh, this is. In a way, the demo, we can also go and check uh, our cluster, right? So if I now do kubectl get pods, I and in default, I see that a new pod is running here. Earlier, uh, there were no pods, right? If you if you look at this command kubectl get pods, it said no resources found, right? 
So I have a QCT will get pods. I see a pod. If I do pods, come I see. I also see that a web app service has been created. The type of the service is load balancer, and this is the IP address of the load balancer. So uh, we can also make, maybe make a small change, one small change, and, and run the pipeline again, just to solidify the demo. So if I go to let's say pages uh, index HTML, yeah, this is the page. So I add hello global Azure community in 2023 and beyond. And add a few more exclamations, right? So this is the change that I want to push. Uh, if I just check get status, see if I would get add app. Comment. Awesome messaging. Get push. OK, uh, so let's look at the pipelines again. I go to pipeline. Yeah. Um, cool. It's doing something. Now this time it should it, it won't ask for any approvals, hopefully, for deployment because you've already approved it once. Okay, so build part is done. So if you see after the build and push, uh, I forgot to show you the bash output. If you remember that we added a small uh, task for bash where we said hello world from Azure DevOps pipeline that also gets executed. But uh, this is a good hack. If you want to do any pre or post processing uh, in your pipeline, you can maybe send out uh, notifications to your Slack channel, uh, call some web hooks, use your internal tracking system, whatever you want to do, right? Essentially. Uh, you can achieve that using a bash uh, task. So build is complete, deploy is complete. Let's go to my application. Amazing. So it says hello global Azure community in 2023. Uh, so yeah, I guess that that pretty much covers up the demo. Uh, I guess I still have time. Uh, do we still have time, Nandeep, or do we break for Q&A? Uh, there was one small feature I would just want to cover. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead with it. Okay. So uh, the approval part, there's there's one really interesting thing which you get out of the box in, in Azure DevOps, uh, which is again a pain in, in, in other tools. So if I go to environments uh, and if I select dev environment and I go to approvals and checks, okay, let me just maximize this. I go to approvals and checks. So going to approvals, I can add usernames here, right? Uh, so if I want to, let's say, protect my production uh, branch deployment, and I would want only a handful of people to be able to deploy, uh, you know, to that branch, irrespective of whoever is pushing the code, I can restrict that that particular uh, environment and and uh, you know add a list of whitelisted users here. So I just add my name here. I create this approval. So uh, after this, what will happen is. Uh, Again, let's let's make a small change beyond with security and approvals. Okay. So I will get a get commit. Awesome security. Get push. So fine, the pipeline is on again. Just wait for the build to complete.
Okay. So now you see uh, the message has changed here. It says one approval needs your review, right? So typically, uh, what what you would want in your in your organization uh, is that for your non-prod environments like your dev environments or staging environments or or your feature environments, you would want your Git push to directly result into a deployment into the cluster or the target environment. But for your protected environments, let's say your staging uh, or or your integration environment, right, or your production environment. You would want some kind of gatekeeping. Uh, you would want some kind of approval mechanism. Uh, it it usually is for security, but it will, it could also be for compliance reasons. So now, uh, unless I, uh, the whitelisted user, uh, goes and approves this particular build, uh, it is not going to get deployed, right? So if I just say approve, my deployment will get triggered here. Okay. So this is done. Cool. Let's see garden approvals. So with that, uh, uh, I would say the demo is done. There are some resources that I've added some links uh, uh, that uh, you, you might find helpful, especially the Azure DevOps Labs. You do check it out if you if you are kind of interested or if you are new to Azure DevOps. It has a lot of uh, you know uh, pre-built labs for you, which you can just pick and choose and get up to speed. And yeah, thank you. Any questions?